Hi, everybody. Welcome back to CDOIQ 2024. We're here in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the Hyatt Regency overlooking the Charles River. The boats are out. They're rowing. I'm Dave Vellante. Paul Gillen is also here along with Sanjeev Mohan. We've been here two days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage of CDOIQ, the, the premier chief data officer conference. This is the 18th year of CDOIQ, the eighth year for the Cube covering this event. I'm really excited to introduce you to Nusrath Mohammed, who's the data practice leader at TCS Tata Consulting Services. Ms. Ruth, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks so much for coming on. It's great to see you. Thank you, Dave, and thank you very much. Nice seeing you and uh, thanking. I've wanted to meet you for the longest time. I've been following you since last 10 years, and you and uh, John uh, are my, you know, the heroes, the <laughs> Kevin Costner and Mel Gibson <laughs> ah, of, the, like of the data world. Come on, <laughs> yeah, that's amazing to hear it's, from, from it's uh, uh, lovely uh, to meet you. Uh, thank, you. thank you, thank you so much. You're making my dream come true. Oh, well, it's, it's, it's our pleasure, <laughs> believe me. So tell us about your role uh, at Tata and your background. Yeah, definitely. So first about my background, I have over 20 years of experience in data and data world. Um, started out, uh, First of all, started out as an IT, uh, what do you call, consultant with the uh, SAP, and then from the get-go itself, uh, you know, I started with data, and uh, so that kind of got me into data world. I loved uh, statistics, and uh, so that kind of uh, got me excited, and uh, and from there on, you know, worked with the Department of Defense and uh, with you know large. Uh, number of systems, bringing those l systems into one platform, and I'm the data lead for those uh, aspects, and uh, that uh, kind of kept me challenged, entertained, and going, and uh, from there, um, uh, what you call, started working on, the, you know, building strategies, uh, you know, when we are migrating data, we are migrating uh, uh, from one system to another, and then what happens is we have to cleanse that data, and then now, after we cleanse it, then how do we keep it clean? And that kind of, uh, you know, answering that question uh, kept me into, you know, uh, what do you call, let's bring the data governance, uh, you know, have a you know, much more solid data strategy from start to end and ongoing and things of that sort. So um, now with TCS, that's what I help, uh, uh, you know, with the clients uh, offering from start to end, from conceptualizing, from um, building a business case, uh, you know, on uh, why do we need to, uh, data to be cleansed, and that is the biggest aspect, you know. Cleansing is very tedious, long, lengthy work, so we have to build, uh, you know, uh, convincing business cases and um, bring, uh, you know, from leadership to uh, everywhere, uh, you know, downwards that, uh, you know, this is important for your organization and your culture. and. Um, and, and, and then from there, you know, how do we keep it clean? So that, those are some of the things, and, and that's um, exciting for me. <laughs> so it's, it's really, so you've gone from practitioner to now helping other practitioners, mm -hmm. and you, you, you've, you've seen a, quite a journey. I mean, it used to be SPSS and SAS. You know, we were a, sta a, a statistician or somebody who was really good with statistics. That was the extent of data. Yeah. Uh, and then they all became data scientists. <laughs> and some were true data scientists, some were just stat pros, and you know the whole Hadoop movement and, and big data. Um, but people really, I think, generally underestimated the exponential growth of data and what you could do with it. And then now, I mean, I'm fast forward, there's a very compressed version of history here, but then now you have, you have, you have AI coming in, and it, it, it's interesting to hear you talk about the business case for data cleansing, because if you don't, you know, the bromide is if you don't have clean data, you don't you don't have AI. There's you don't have AI, and it's, that's the saddest part. We have been, t you know, propagating, or we have been trying to bring that awareness to the organizations that you need your cl data cleansed, uh, you know, for your analytics to be more um, trustable, reliable, you know, things of that sort. So, but you know, it was not hitting uh, to the heart or the, to the core, I guess. And now, you know, because AI. Everybody wants to jump on that bandwagon, but then now we realize data is not cleansed, <laughs> and then we have to go backwards and tr start cleaning that first, and then, okay, now we can jump on that bandwagon. So, so. what's a business case look like before Gen AI for, data, for convincing leaders to cleanse their data, and what's the business case look like after? Has it changed, or is it the same? Uh, I mean, 
See, so Gen AI, um, the business case for Gen AI, I mean, it's good it came out. It's a beautiful toy uh, to play with. Um, but I mean, so before Gen AI, the business case was uh, still AI was there. So still right. ma machine learning is there. So that uh, that has been, you know, since the past five years, I have been, you know, uh, uh, catching fire. So because of those, um, uh, you know, you have to have your data. So the realization of data uh, to be, you know, more tidy, more uh, pristine has been m more, uh, you know, in the forefront because of AI. So Gen AI, yeah, last one year Gen AI came, but even before that AI was there. And even before that, you know, the hype of uh, big data was there. So, but big data wasn't working because still your foundational data is not clean, right? Your foundational data is not ready for you. So uh, now the hype of big data is gone, but then, you know, you do have data. You have lo lots, large amounts of data, and it is growing in, you know, uh, exponentially as we see. I, I mean, maybe whatever the data we are creating in one day has been <laughs> created, uh, so, current one day data creation is like almost equivalent of what we have created since last 100 years. So that is uh, the exponential growth of data. Now how do we manage it and how do we uh, you know, keep it controlled? And that is the biggest question, biggest uh, challenge in the organizations. So how do we make sense out of that? But then again, still your foundational data has to be cleansed, have to be ready so to support that. Let me ask it differently. So mm -hmm. I, I, I get the business case for uh, having cleansed data for, mm -hmm. Sorry, for, for, no, that's okay, <laughs> for, for, um, for dashboards, right? You're gonna have better dashboards, you're gonna have better agreement, you're gonna serve the business better, um, you're gonna have better analytics, and then things like Snowflake made that even simpler, lowered the, the denominator component of the business case, um, or Databricks, if you wanted to really do some heavy machine learning, you could apply that and need having cleansed data for those use cases. Yeah. Now at Gen AI comes in, it's like, okay, I, I, this is interesting you said it's a toy because th this gets to the, what, the heart of what I'm trying to get to, which I know I'm not doing a great job of asking the question, but you'll no, help no, me. No, no, I is, think is, is, is it, because it's a toy, it's like, okay, where's the real value? And so that's what I'm kind of getting to. Our clients s saying, okay, I got I to gotta clean my data so I can take advantage of Gen AI, but then what do they do with it? it if you look at what people are doing with Gen AI, it's like, I call them very chatty applications. They're summarizing text, or they're, maybe they're making some images of some of that. Uh, maybe they be doing chat bots. Um, they're writing code, the code assist. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice, but it's kind of toys. And, and so, how much of the business case can you actually drive with some of these new use cases? It sounds like it's still the same fundamental. It's, it's get your data house in order, and then there's so many things you can do in analytics, and maybe leveraging Gen AI, maybe supply chain, et cetera. Does that make sense? What are you seeing in terms of the value? Where's the value around, around cleansing the data and has it changed is really what I'm trying so, to get to. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, Sorry, I didn't answer it properly earlier. No, you did. It was just I'm trying to get to the heart of yeah, it, and it's sort yeah. of a fuzzy thing, right? Because no, it is. Yeah. It, it, it's it's uh, it was a little bit challenging. How do I integrate Gen AI? I mean, I, I see a lot of tools out there right now. Uh, um, on Monday, uh, how Purview was showcased, and it's a beautiful tool. But then I'm asking the question: um, that that tool can be utilized only at the top layer. You know, once uh, we have the data, on, you know, in data lake has been built, so it's at the top layer. But what about the at the layer of the data inception? And then one of the so when we dig in a little bit more on uh, you know how Gen AI can be utilized, so the answer uh, you know in that group came about was you have to put in Gen AI at all levels, and that is that clicked. Okay, and that is where we can utilize Gen AI. So when, during the data inception, when your data is coming into your source systems, then apply Gen AI there and see, detect, okay, and give us a report up there and say, okay, your uh, addresses are not matching, you know, the accurate addresses. So we are already doing a Google search or, you know, whatever the API you want to use, and uh, here is your dirty, you know, 
or even when the user is actually creating that data, you give the help. Hey, your address, you might have uh, you know, uh, put in the building number incorrectly here. This could be the right building number. So it is already detecting that and helping you, aiding you. Makes sense. From there, and then you know, when you're doing at a um, change level, you're at doing at an interfaces level, so you're putting those uh, controls that uh, Gen AI in that uh, levels, and then now you bring it at the top level, and now you want to bring your insights. So now you know 140 tables in your data lake, or you know thousand tables in your data lake, and now you're doing it. Yeah, you're going to have much more better outputs too, and also you know it would be a little bit lesser to correct uh, your data at that level. So this is how I see Gen AI, you know, helping and supporting. Uh, what we are doing and uh, even for the end results. So Interesting, so it's not necessarily driving the business case per se, it's supporting the overall activity, making it you know, easier, natural language, et cetera. You, know, um, you brought up purview, which is interesting, and I want to ask you, um, I got another kind of long-winded question that you're going to have to help me parse <laughs> through. Good. So purview is Microsoft's catalog of catalog, I'll call it, but it's more than just governance, it's security, yeah, role-based access control, uh, but it's not meant to compete per se with uh, catalogs like uh, Polaris or uh, Horizon or Unity. It sits on top of those. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So in thinking about where we're at with governance. I mean, actually, if I go back to Hadoop days, very complicated, very hard to do. You, Spark comes along, makes it somewhat easier, but you still need a lot of really smart people. Um, you've got the cloud, so you've got catalogs in the cloud. You've got now these open source catalogs. And take, take the example of Snowflake. People said, okay, we'll get your data house in order, put it all into Snowflake. That was Snowflake's. Mm -hmm. um, put all the eggs in the Snowflake basket. And that it was easy to do but it wasn't practical for your entire data state. So now people are saying, we want open table formats, like Iceberg, and we want to bring any compute to the data. We don't, not, we don't want to just separate, and you're, you're technical, I'm not an engineer, but no, so we can, okay. you can, we can geek out for the audience if you like. <laughs> but rather than just separating compute from storage, which did a lot of great things, made it cloud, infinite capacity, et cetera, we want to separate compute from data, so we can bring any engine whether it's Trino or Spark or Snowflake, any engine, mm -hmm. we want to own the data. Okay. So now you have all these new formats coming out with Polaris and Horizon and, and Unity and, and they're open source. And then the big question is how do I govern them? That's what I ask every customer. Okay, great, we, have you chosen, chosen one? Well, we want open table formats. How are you going to govern them? Well, we don't know. <laughs> We're not really sure yet. W but again, I told you it was a long-winded question. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing there? How, what's your perspective? I'm really interested in your perspective, thinking about the history of how data and big data, and now AI data have evolved, especially in the context of governance, which is your specialty area, and how customers are thinking about solving that problem of marrying open table formats with and governing them. Um, so governing uh, open data or open data uh, formats uh, is going to be a little bit challenging when it comes to companies, right? Organization, private companies, even um, you know what you call federated or public sector. So it's going to be challenging on that aspect. Uh, but what I have seen um, a presentation, you know, on Monday by AWS. So they have given a pretty nice. It, it's like flying saucer methodology of uh, go data governance. You know, innovate and do small, uh, and then. Uh, experiment and then go back and then govern your data. So that was uh, interesting and uh, I, I really loved uh, that, you know, out of the box uh, thinking of governance and I want to apply that and see how it would work and... Um, how so that's interesting because I see it as, it's like Republicans and Democrats, so I think, uh, maybe a bad analogy these days, but AWS has many, many different data platforms, like 15. Mm -hmm. You got Aurora, you got, you, you got uh, Redshift, you have DynamoDB, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the, they don't have a unified metadata sort of strategy. You have, you have, you have, meta, or, uh, you, have, you, have you have the technical metadata is in uh, Glue, 
um, maybe I'm baby. Uh, yeah. For in interfaces, but uh, they have S3. They have. Yeah, they have to S3. Okay, yeah, have and then S3. but the operational metadata, the business metadata, might be in data zones. I'm kind of making this up, but you've got you've got different uh, catalogs distributed right all over the place. They haven't unified the metadata yet. <laughs> um, is my sense, but maybe um, maybe with S3 they've got the answer there. Whereas then you look at Snowflake, they're saying, okay, we're going to open source Polaris, which is the technical metadata, but we're going to keep Horizon, as the you're going to pay for that, that's not open source, but it has all the role-based access controls, we're going to do managed iceberg tables, and then you have Databricks saying, we have, we're going to open source uh, the Unity catalog. They pushed a button on stage. They, I don't know if you saw that, Matei, no, Matei no. Zaharia. Okay. It was, you know, Snowflake and, and, uh, Databricks. and Databricks are like okay. Hatfields and McCoys. So in the Snowflake conference the week before, they open source Polaris. The week after, Matei on stage pushed a button and open sourced Unity catalog. Like, ha ha, <laughs> you know, gotcha. <laughs> but then when you dig into it, you actually need the Spark execution engine to actually take advantage of that. So is it really open source? It's open source, but you, okay, so, so customers are confused, right? Uh, and, and so, and it comes back to how are you going to govern all this stuff? And the, the likely answer is I'm going to have a little AWS. I'm probably going to have some Databricks because we know there's high overlap in those accounts. I'm going to have some Snowflake. I'm going to have to make some choices whether I go Polaris or Horizon. Or, yeah. and, and then I'm going to, I got Microsoft, I, everybody has Microsoft. So yes, yeah, throw some purview <laughs> in there. And you have this mess. How do I, this is where you guys come in. This is, this is heaven for Tata. <laughs> it's like great, all this wonderful complexity. It, it, right? Yeah, so, hyperscaler. So, right? Yeah, right, and Google. We forgot about Google. Can't forget about Google. So how do you help me as a customer solve this? Because that's what my environment's going to look like. We know this. It's, it's going to be a complex problem. It's going to be fragmented, and, be. And, but that's the way the world is, right? That's yeah. the reality and, of what and this looks like. And that is the complexity, and and, and that's uh, that's uh, see that. Uh, and then when you go in some of these, Gen AI is going to fix that complexity. No, it won't. I mean, you have right. to have, you <laughs> have to have a little bit more of a traditional way of solving problems, and then Gen AI might facilitate in solving those problems. That's what I, I, I want to hear from our you know presenters or things of that sort. So that is where, you know, I, I come in with the with that pinch of salt and say. Um, is Purview going to solve, I don't want to be, <laughs> you know. No, no, you have to be, you have to be agnostic to the technology, yeah, so I understand. If, but if, just is, a, and, you know, is this solution going to solve all my problems because, you know, you have embedded Gen AI in there? No, it's, it's not. I mean, you have to put in some of that, uh, uh, you know, machine learning uh, skills and, uh, you know, the data science, the whole nine yards of it. You know, after probably Gen AI has given me some feedback, maybe I still need to apply uh, the traditional uh, tools uh, to get to actual solution. So those are some of the challenges. I, 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 or the the talk which I'm not hearing and which I would like to hear. It's like that. This is not my silver bullet. This is you know at least aiding me and then going. That's the gap right now. I mean yeah. we definitely see. I mean Oracle would disagree with this, but we see the the point of control moving from the DBMS to the governance catalog. But the point of value is sort of leaping over the governance catalog because the governance catalog is getting commoditized because everybody's open sourcing it. So now you think about, okay, with this whole idea of co-pilots and agency and being able to have unified metadata and to be able to take uh, co-pilots and systems of, of agents to take multiple tool chains to solve really hard problems like supply chain and so forth. But those, this is more futuristic, but intelligent applications that are data apps, using data to actually create create apps, that's very futuristic, um, some, but something that we think is coming. But, but yeah. still, I mean, they have to learn what we are doing, right? So we have to, the co-pilots might help, but not right now. Right. It will learn from me what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and then it will give me much more, you know, intelligent um, advice at the end. But I don't think it is it is giving me intelligent advice at this moment. No, but that, the bottom line is you have to have clean data in, yeah. before you can do any yeah. of that. Mr. Hot, thank you so much for coming on the cube. We're thank out of time. You. We can I'd leave love it there. To have, All right, uh, so good back and forth. I, I met my Mel Gibson. <laughs> <here>. <laughs> oh, <that's, laughs> oh, stop! Oh, no, don't get up! Don't get oh, up! Don't okay. get up! All right, keep it right there, buddy. We'll be back right after this short break. You're watching CDOIQ 2024 from the Hyatt Regency in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We'll be right back. You're watching the cube.